Welcome. So welcome to our talk on uh, the Java memory model and some of the changes that are in Java 9 and a bit, a bit of history as well. Um, who are we? So um, I'll, I'll go first as Ben's still micing up. Uh, I'm James, or Jim as most people call me. Uh, some people call me other things as well. Some of them are offensive, but anything <laughs> will do. Um, so I'm a Java developer at the moment, an architect working on uh, APIs and API strategy and things like that. Um, in my spare time, obviously got loads of that, um, I quite enjoy training, uh, mentoring and writing. I was actually a technical trainer uh, for, for a good four years. Um, and yeah, we've sort of been aspiring whiskey expert, which is based on some of Ben's teachings. <laughs> okay, uh, thanks Jim. Um, as you can see, that pitch was taken quite a long time ago. Um, I've been working um, with Jim for some years now. Um, I actually hired him to his first job uh, in, in the city, so it was, yeah, it was 11 years ago to tell them that. <laughs> um, yeah, and it's, it, I just want to thank Frank and, and the team for having us here this evening uh, to go and talk to all of you. And to underline what he said, come and see Venkat next month because Ben Cat could quite literally turn up and read his laundry list, and you would still have a good night. <laughs> cool. Yeah, so we've done uh, together quite a few things. Uh, so both of us have been involved with the Java Community Process Executive Committee um, through the London Java Community. Uh, along with that, we kind of, uh, together with some others like Martin in, in the London Java Community, uh, founded uh, an initiative called Adopter JSR. Uh, probably one of our biggest JSRs there was JSR 310, which is a daytime API, uh, which we actually contributed to code and test to. Um, and Ben's a Java champion and rock star, and many of the accolades that have got good Java things in. Um, also, Ben, you introduced the books that you've, you've written. Yeah, so, so basically, um, the, the big headline news, and actually what brings us to New York at this time, uh, is that we have just finished and is now in production optimizing Java for O'Reilly. Um, which is the, the performance book that Jim and I have been working on for 18 months now. It's, yeah. It might even be three years. It might be two years. <laughs> but it, the good news is it's actually hopefully pretty complete now. Um, so that is um, that's going to be coming out in about, about five or six weeks' time. Um, the ebook will be out a little sooner on, on Safari. Uh, before that, I, I wrote a few other things. Um, the Web Grammar Job Club, uh, uh, which apparently is. The Chinese edition here. <laughs> well, I don't quite know how that is put in there, but there we go. Uh, and Java in a nutshell. Um, version six is up there. I took it over after uh, I think David Fallingham did, did version five, and then I, I took it over with version six. Other big news, which just came out the last week, there will be a seventh edition coming out uh, in the autumn in time for Java 11. So that's that's the books, and there's various other videos and things um, out there as well. So. That's my job. Yeah, absolutely. So, so what are we going to talk to you about tonight? Um, we're going to talk a little bit about performance landscape really briefly just to set the scene. Uh, we're then going to talk about, well, look at a problem, always good to look at something in context of an issue, uh, and, and look at what the Java memory model is, why do we need one. Um, and then Ben's going to talk to you a little bit about unsafe, uh, some of the changes in Java 9 which is kind of added to the memory model, uh, and then a little bit about VAR handles as well. So a lot of the things that we've been working on over the last three years, and, and probably a long, a long time before we started working on the book as well, has been like trying to demystify some of what's going on with the Java ecosystem. Uh, one thing that you're probably all aware of, or at least seen, the code that you end up writing is, is very different to what ends up being executed. So it goes through this translation to bytecode. <coughs> That translation to bytecode is actually fairly simple. Not much actually happens there. It's just a straight through translation. And then things happen um, actually at runtime. So the bytecode and the optimizations and just in time compiler, all that is kind of in the magic of the Java ecosystem. Uh, it's a lot smarter than I am in terms of what it does. So what we're going to touch on specifically is going to be around like looking at some of the bytecode, looking at how it deals with it in a concurrent sort of way. Um, and relates to the Java memory model. So let's have a look at a simple problem, um, which some of you will probably have seen or at least encountered before, uh, is this idea of a counter. Okay, So maybe you want to count some hits on a website, that kind of thing. So we have our counter class uh, in, in the top left, uh, with a private int and a function for incrementing. 
And then we have just a, a sample test runner where we do 100 iterations and we print out uh, the values as they, as they go through. Obviously expecting them all to, to increment as they go. Um, probably can sort of see that there's going to be an issue here, or potentially. One of the best things, so, so normally when I do this demo, I try and run it live, and it always works. It never, it never has that missing value, so I haven't even gone with that today. Um, and that's one of the great things about concurrent programs. It's, it's the things that I find is really exciting, is that um, it's very hard to prove that something is working, where it's actually quite easy to prove that something isn't working. You, know, you get that kind of, it, it must be working, so because I run this test, and it, it's all fine. Then you put on a slightly different machine, or there's something else running on the box, and then it all goes really bad. Okay, so yeah, this idea of like, and there's two threads here, and they're both printing the value one, which is where, where the issue is coming from. So our simple problem, we're going to look at how you, we resolve that, and I think probably most of you have a few tricks up your sleeves there. Um, but the simple problem turns out to be a not so simple problem in terms of what's actually going on in the background. So thinking about Java, it was designed to be fast enough. Okay, looking back at 1995, um, it was actually quite slow then. <laughs> but it was designed to do the job. It was designed to be easier than like programming in C++. Um, I spent the last two years working at Bloomberg, uh, teaching people out of university how to code in C++. And if you haven't had that pleasure recently of looking at how many uh, segmentation faults you get, and memory management issues, and all kinds of weird stuff, um, those that have a go, just to remind yourself how lucky you are to do Java, um, or lucky depending on your viewpoint. Um, and yeah, we've benefited greatly from Moore's Law. So this idea that things have got a lot quicker, and eventually we've got to this point where, you know, Java wasn't really intended to be high performance to begin with, but it's now capable of running many high performance systems. Um, and for, for those of you that are interested, uh, looking into things um, such as the Aeron project and the Agrona project uh, that's, that's out of Martin Thompson space in the high performance Java uh, is actually fascinating, like some of the things that they're doing and, and kind of the, the level of thought that they have around like, how to make things quick. Okay, this idea of a consistent programming model, um, but let's have, a look, let's have a look at some graphs. So this, this is an interesting graph, this is, this is Moore's Law. Uh, the idea that pretty much since when this graph begins, right up until now, the idea is that the transistor count has been increasing year on year. And if you look at the part of this graph from 95 up to like 2004-ish, that graph is, is pretty steep. And that's around the time the Java came out and benefited from uh, a lot of transistor uptake. Um, it's also like worth pointing out that probably as far as, you know, 1980 feels pretty ancient when you talk about things like um, what well, spring only arriving in 2005, and that feels quite old these days. You know, this it's, it's something that spanned our industry for for a huge amount of time. It's also worth pointing out this graph, of course, is uh, it's log linear, so it's it looks like a straight line, and it's not a straight line. That's an exponential curve. So between 1990 and 2005, the chip, the transistor count on the chip increases from 1 million transistors to 100 million. So that the latter part of that, where, where, the, where it has that steep exponential growth, is right when Java starts to come into a sweet spot. So it's kind of a, a happy accident that it, it came out in 95 and, and had that advantage for that, for that period of, of, of about 10 years. But however, as we're about to discover, things are not quite that rosy. No, definitely not. Well, otherwise we wouldn't have a talk. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, although processor and sort of like processor performance has increased um, almost like again like quite quite rapidly, uh, the performance of memory has not been the same. Okay, so it's been a lot. I mean, it has improved. It's been, but it's a lot shallower in terms of um, sort of its growth in terms of performance. Now, the interesting thing here is I always think about this in terms of my own applications and problems that I've run into before. Uh, if, if, you, if you've done this, you, you know exactly what I mean. When something start, is running slow, what do we normally do? I'll probably put a cache in front of it and hope that that makes the performance kind of like uh, improve loads. Um, 
that actually then has some like, problems, like you know, when we'll, as we'll talk about in the next bit. I'll just back up just one. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah, there's, there's just one point here that I want to want to clarify because obviously the units, the processor, and memory speed are not going to be the same, right? Um, so the way that you want to look at this graph is to, to come all the way back here to 1980, okay? Where these two lines cross at, at the point one. And what that really means is that in 1980, um, a memory access instruction on a processor is no slower to dispatch than anything else, e.g. an arithmetic operation, okay? And so now, what this is saying is pretty clear, that coming up to 2010, memory has increased by a factor of 10, so memory has got tenfold faster, but at the same time, the processor speed or the transistor count has increased 10,000 times. So there is now a very sharp differential between the, the dispatch time of a, a memory access and one of a, of an arithmetic operation. Cool, so a modern CPU architecture, as we're gonna dig into a little bit now, um, as I mentioned, you know, if you, if you need to make things quicker, you usually put a cache in, in place. Uh, and that's, that's pretty much what we do. So you've got this idea of an L1, L2, L3 cache. We'll talk about the, the difference in response times uh, in those in a second. Uh, and then you've got this idea of multiple cores. So although we still saw that transistor rate going up, you know, the, it's very difficult to get that onto the same core now. So you know, the free lunch is all over, and we're starting to think about multi-core systems, all, you know, almost as standard. Uh, if you're running the JDM, you're already taking advantage of multiple cores, even if you kind of like notionally only you've got one application for it. There's lots of things going on that behind the scenes. One other thing that's quite interesting to note is like with this um, with, with this picture is as well as kind of like this idea of memory um, and, and caching, you've also got the idea that um, the, the processes have got quite complicated now. So even the sequences of instructions that you might expect to be linear can be reordered and put through different sections of the CPU. So again, you're going to sort of like see things that or unexpected things as well uh, as what you would see like memory and things in caches. So in terms of cache coherency, this now becomes a problem that we have to deal with. Okay, um, a lot of the times, like the when we think about like trying to sort of structure cache coherency and structure the way that we sort of access memory, we have this higher level way of thinking. But behind the scenes, the processes are doing quite a lot of complicated um, diff and different protocols to manage that. So we'll look at what those mean in code, but when you're, when you're writing um, sort of like within the Java memory model effectively, you are sort of like managing some of where, or giving instructions as to how that cache coherency should like pay attention to what you're doing, okay? If you did that in C++, you'd have a lot more control. In Java, we've got a few ways of, uh, that we kind of like tweak this to make it work in the way that you'd expect. But remember that principle that you're giving up low level control for a consistent programming model. And also bear in mind that Java is a very forward-looking and very ambitious language from 20 years ago. And one of the things that it, it's, it's ambitious about is platform independence. So there's a, a mismatch between the guarantees and the consistency that the language and the programming environment want to provide and what is actually present and implemented on the hardware. And that mismatch uh, goes some way to explaining some of the aspects of the, the memory model we'll talk to you later. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to skip, skip straight to the, the idea of the protocol. So um, for, if, you, if you do try and go look this up, by the way, uh, it's, it's messy with 1S. If you try to type this into Google, it will tell you that it's a footballer, but if you, if you persevere, you will find a bit more information here. Um, and the idea here is, is, is all to do with cache lines, okay? And as you, if, you, um, if you start to look at something called mechanical sympathy, which I, I'm sure you've probably heard of in, in at least some of the other talks, it's the idea that you kind of have to have an appreciation about some of these things, even if your program is not directly kind of influencing them. Um, this, this cropped up for me only a few days ago, where I was looking at Jetty 8, which is like the HTTP inbound requester. Um, um, and it's, Jetty 8 is maybe four years old, but due to like library constraints and probably that nice dependency graph would have, would have told me this, um, the, the idea there was that I, I profiled it and I could see an array blocking queue was like the big problem. Um, I went into a little bit more detail there to try to figure out what was going on. Um, and it was an array blocking queue implemented by the Jetty team. 
which they've now fixed in version 9. Um, but what was happening was it was getting all confused with cache lines. So it was actually, um, it had two threads that were running side by side, accessing the same cache line, which makes things go really crazy because of things like this, this protocol I'm about to tell you about. So it was actually conflicting with itself and contending with itself, and slowing down the whole, the whole process. Um, so some of these things, they, they come out as you start to look at performance, as you start to go a little bit further. So Messi takes the view that um, using a cache line, it will tell you what its state is on another CPU, okay? So it gives you kind of like this relationship or this model um, that prevents you from basically like reading a value that you didn't expect to read because it's been updated somewhere else, okay? So there are, there are four, four ways that you kind of can view something. So it's modified, so you've changed it locally, but it's not been it's not actually being flushed back to main memory. So it's just local on that processor. Um, you could say it's exclusive. So it's only present on that one sort of core. Um, and it matches main, so it's, it's there and ready. And it's not being used elsewhere. And shared is where it's being used in both places. So that's where you kind of like have to be aware that you, know, you could get into a state where that, that memory has changed. Um, and that would be sort of like marked by changing to invalid when it was accessed in the other core. So it's constantly basically moving these cache lines back and forwards out of main memory to make your program react quicker um, without having to pay the cost of accessing main memory. Uh, this table just kind of shows those states. So um, if it's more like you, I kind of like view this as one side is one CPU and one side is another. So if it's, if it's modified, um, in one, then it can only be invalid in the other. And you can kind of read that across to match those states to give you how things would, would kind of look. Um, and there's also a transition model for how they go through. And you can actually go and look in detail at some of the operations that cause the model to transition from, from state to state. Now, this is probably the most important part of, of why we have Messy and why we care about it, is this access, of, uh, access time and memory. So I like to, I like to, I like this graph actually, it's a nice one Ben, but I like to think of this in terms of trying to acquire a beer, because it makes more sense to me. So, so going to a register is like me saying, Ben give me a beer, and he, him being able to magically materialize one in my hand, as soon as I say that, is instantly available, okay? L1 cash might be that Ben has some beer in his bag and he's going to open it and give it to me. L2 would be, well, he's going to run outside and find somewhere to, to, to get that beverage from. Um, L3, maybe he's got to take a train somewhere, because I want something specific, probably from Brooklyn. Uh, and main memory would be him jumping on a flight back to London, getting me a beer and bringing it all the way back. If Concord was around, I'd challenge you to it, but anyway. So, so there is obviously a big cost. So if you, if you have like cash misses, you get a bit slow down. All these things change your interleaving so happening inside concurrent processing. So this is a scary graph. <laughs> the main thing to take away from this graph is that we are going basically multi-core, uh, and more and more of those as, as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, the, the clock speed is the, is the thing to look at here, because this is essentially the same as two other graphs we've seen before. The two plots of Moore's law are both this green line here. Uh, but if you look at the clock speed, you'll see that basically it's flattened out. That linear increase, or exponential as it actually is, is no longer taking place. And instead, our clock speed is plateaued, which we know. Yeah? We, don't, we don't have five or six gigahertz chips in our machines. Yeah? What are they? Two gigahertz? Maybe three? Yeah? It's, it's flattened out up here. Um, and then, of course, you know, the, the, the light blue line is the, the power, which is probably good that that has flatlined, because otherwise our chips would melt. Um, so that's actually probably the only piece of good news that there is uh, on this graph. But the overall takeaway, of course, is our chips aren't getting any faster. We have problems with the speed of main memory. All we have left, really, that we can do is multi-core. OK, so let's go back to our simple problem and talk a little bit about how we could fix it. So of course, we could just rewrite it in another language. That might help us fix uh, one of our problems. Uh, we could maybe uh, sprinkle a synchronized in there. Um, I don't know if you ever been in a situation where you have situ you have like a team and they've tried to do something multi-threaded and it just haven't, hasn't worked. So they've then gone and added synchronize onto every method. 
So you have to be careful with that. It's, it's not like uh, just throw it in there. And there are, there are far more better ways to do that in Java Util concurrent as well, like brilliant package. Um, you might want to add a volatile, though will that help you? We'll, we'll see. So, so there are a couple of ways that we could look to fix this problem. Um, so let's have a look at bytecode for a little bit. I'm just going to point out a few things here which kind of give you an idea of, of what's going on at least. So in here what we've got is we've got the idea that you, well, maybe it doesn't quite point up there, but the idea that you're effectively doing a load of the value. Uh, you get the field, which is the, the value i. Um, you load the constant, which is one, I think, in this case. Yeah, it's, uh, true. it's a true constant, so it's, it's just the value one. Cool. Uh, you add them together, and then you put the value back. Pretty much that's, that's the kind of like the very quick way of explaining that bytecode. Now, when we go to our counter main, you, this, is, this is an example of those operations running on two threads. So we've got thread A and thread B down the side there. Now, the interesting thing here that Ben was explaining to me earlier, I was like, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense if, if it's multi-core. But you could actually get the same problem on a single core machine, okay? Because of the idea of um, the, the way that the scheduler works. In the, if you look at this example, you're going through running on thread A nicely. You just got to the point where you're about to put the value back and then your operating system kicks you off and reschedules the next thread. And then you've got the idea that you run through B and you'll see that doesn't get interrupted. And then all of a sudden when A comes back on, it's basically lost the update. So when I was looking at this earlier, I was like, yes, in a multi-core environment that would definitely happen or, or could definitely happen. But it's also true of a single core environment as well. The problem is, and I, I remember when I, when I first started building Java code, um, whenever it was, um, you, you, you see as you get more cores, the increased interleavings and the more chances of things going wrong. So the idea was that like, programs that were previously correct and working fine were not. And that, that caused some interesting uh, outages. So we're really asking a few key questions then. It's like, what happens when two cores access the same data? Are they actually guaranteed to see the same value? And then what happens in terms of memory caches that might affect these answers? And that's where the Java memory model really looks to come in and solve. Uh, it's been around since uh, version one. It had a significant update and was fixed for Java 5. And then Java 9 introduces a, a new evolution. It's a lot more important, especially as we start to see more cores. Um, and we want to know that what happens when two cores access the same data. And this is pretty much what the memory model will clarify for us. So it provides some guarantees. Um, it provides this idea of a happens before relationship. So that means that one event, and you can scope out what that event means, definitely happens before another is allowed to proceed. Okay. Now the word synchronize is a funny word, right? because people often view it as locks. But it's a little bit more than that. Okay. It's, it's the idea of taking an event, and it's going to make sure that that event, once complete, goes back into main memory, so that you don't have this idea of a potentially a lost update. Now, this is another interesting one. I mentioned that uh, CPUs and processors do a lot of reordering of instructions. Um, by, using, by using the Java memory model, you're going to say that within this block, regardless of what's happened, it's going to appear as though it's happened in, in, in a serial fashion. So you get that kind of uh, abstraction that you can then reason and work with. Uh, and then this idea of release before acquire, so locks will be released before being acquired by another. Obviously, if that didn't happen, we'd have even more fun than we have with concurrent programming already. So there are two possible approaches to a Java memory model, a strong and a weak model. Okay? Now a strong model would make sure that whenever you do it right, all of the cores get the same value. Um, it turns out that Java has a weak model, okay? and partly that's because it makes it really easy and really portable with all the different kind of operating systems and combinations that it has to work on. But a strong memory model actually wouldn't it wouldn't really help because you'd end up in a situation where you'd have cache invalidation happening all the time, which would mean that you then end up swamping the memory bus. Um, and as you get more cores, that problem would get even worse. Uh, and you just end up in a situation where it wouldn't really scale. Okay, um, I'm not going to talk about this slide too much other than the one point that this is probably one of the hardest things to understand, the Java language specification. 
Um, there's like ideas of partial ordering, for those of you that can remember university, I'm pretty sure I can't even remember going anymore. Um, so when we think about synchronized then, um, it's the idea of sort of that main memory representation um, being locked, effectively locked. So it's actually, got, it's, you can think about it as two operations. So at the start of the block, you read that main memory, you read that value out, and it's guaranteed to be consistent, and then at the end you write it back through to main memory. Now this has a really important uh, side effect, which is when you're reading, you still have to synchronize as well. Because if you don't, if you think about how this is going to interact with the cache, it's going to just go, I don't need to see the latest value, just give me whatever's there. And that in turn can mean that you miss an update. And I've seen that time and time again from uh, sort of more junior Java developers, the only thing that they have to use synchronize when they are actually writing a value. So you have to be a bit careful with that. Um, there's a little bit of detail here about sort of the sequence of events. So the thread says, I need to modify an object. Okay, so it's asking for access to, to an object. Okay, at that point, it acquires the monitor, and as we know, like every object in, in Java effectively has the, the kind of like the primitive, uh, sorry, the functions that you need to be able to operate in it, on it in a concurrent way and to an associate a monitor with it. Uh, and then it reads or modifies the object, so it has this idea of during that lock process, your object is in an inconsistent state. Now what that usually means is there's a series of operations that need to happen together, otherwise you're potentially going to lose consistency. And then at the end, it's consistent, and it's a legal state, and then the thread releases the, the monitor after it's finished. Okay, so what does volatile do? Apart from again being a stranger name term, name term is different to what it is in other languages, which is always useful. Um, it provides one operation to or from main memory. So by that, there's no locking involved. So if you read a value on a volatile, it's always going to guarantee to go to main memory and give you the latest value. Um, if you write it, it's going to make sure that, that writes through to main memory as well. So that will keep that value visible on all of the different cores. But you have to be careful using volatile. Okay? It, doesn't, it doesn't solve all of your problems for you. So for instance, uh, and as we saw with our counter example, if you try to do V++, it's actually multiple operations. It's kind of a, a load and store. So that means that you can't, because it's, a, it's volatile, it doesn't have any kind of ordering or, or kind of partial ordering involved with it, you would have to use something in a synchronized block. Okay, so they're, they're, they can't cause deadlocks because there are no locks, but they're, they are a lot weaker than using synchronize. Thanks, Jim. Okay, so let's talk a, a little bit and just add a little extra color to, to a couple of things there. Um, we talked about the, the fact that when you use synchronized, you acquire the object monitor. Okay, now remember that the whole point of this countless example was to prevent lost update. So how does the synchronized block do it? Well, because when you acquire the object monitor, any other thread which comes in and attempts to, to enter a synchronized block is going to block. That's going to mean that the operating system is involved and it takes that thread and places it in wait state until it's woken up again. So the way that the, the design of the, the synchronized concurrency, or as it's sometimes called the intrinsic concurrency API, works fundamentally involves the operating system and it involves threads being, being put to sleep giving up their process of time quantum and being waiting to be awakened by the scheduler again. Okay? It's going to be important in a sec. The other thing um, was to do with the bytecode representation that we saw. Um, if, we, if we did write a version of the counter which had volatile as a modifier on the field, we would see that the, the, the bytecode for the methods was absolutely identical. Why? <clears throat> because the volatile nature of the field is stored as metadata on the field itself. It's not present in the bytecode methods. And in fact, we would see that, the, that it, it would behave in exactly the same way as the non-volatile case. We would still see lost updates, as Jim just mentioned. Okay? Both of those things are gonna be important in a sec. All right, so let's talk about Java Util Concurrent. Java Util Concurrent um, obviously came out with Java 5. Uh, and in it, it contains all sorts of things, including the atomic integers. Now, these basically are a standard for volatile variables. They, they can do what I call state-dependent updates, such as increment. 
but they remain lock free and most especially in camera deadlock. It's very, very difficult, in fact, to, to deadlock when you don't have a lock there in the first place. Um, now, the, the composite operations, um, th this means things like hour increment or decrement combined with a get operation as well. And the, the key part of this, which, which makes it work, uh, is the, the compare and set operations, okay? which are absolutely um, crucial to, to how the, these, um, these classes actually operate. Uh, it's worth noting um, that they're not the inheritors of the similarly named classes. So an atomic boolean is not the, 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 the same as a boolean, and an atomic integer isn't an integer. Um, there's two kind of reasons for this. One of which is the, the flippant answer, which is, well, those Java Lang classes, they sure are final. So there's no way that you could inherit from them. And obviously, with backwards compatibility, you wouldn't want to make integer um, non-final. Uh, the other point is, of course, there's no way you would want to ever extend from an integer. You don't want people, programmers, carrying around their crazy implementations and things and being able to use them in places where, where a core class like integer is expected. So for a lot of reasons, they're, 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 not, um, they're not actually, as unfortunately, the, the subclasses of the, the types they seem to be. But let's talk about compare and swap. So the compare and swap basically is, the interesting thing about it is it's not specified in the JMM. We haven't talked about, about that, compare and swap operations. We've mentioned synchronized, we've mentioned happens before, we've mentioned volatile. But none of that actually has anything to say about compare and swap. So that's kind of unfortunate because it's everywhere now. In fact, the last mainstream hardware platform that did not have a compare and swap operation in hardware was Spark 32. And Spark 32 came out really quite a long time ago. Virtually everything that, that's come out that we're likely to program upon has these operations. And they're really, really useful. So what are we going to do? Well, in the rare, bizarre case that we're on some embedded platform or some crazy Heath Robinson CPU, we'll fall back to a lot based implementation if we absolutely have to. But that's not the, the, the common case. Okay, so what are we going to do? Well, we need to get down somehow and deal with the processor directly. It's not specified in the standard, so it can't be cross-platform, so it can't be done in pure Java code. Therefore, somewhere along the line, some native code is going to be involved. Okay? And that code is going to live in this class called unsafe which quite possibly some of you know about. We'll talk about that. How do they work? Well, it, it's quite easy. You, you actually you pass in two values, is, is the, the heart of this. You pass in what you expect the current value to be. And you also pass in what you'd like it to be. And then in one operation, the CPU does this. It checks whether you're right about what you think the current value is. Yeah? If you are, great. It updates it and changes it to the new value that you asked for. Okay? If not, what that means is somebody else was trying to modify it and you lost the race. Sorry. But in either case, what happens is you get back the value that's present after the attempt. Okay? Now this is really crucial because if you do that, well, you've now got a better idea, or hopefully the correct <coughs> idea, of what's actually stored in the value. So that means you can go around and have another go. Now hopefully you can see why this prevents lost update. Because okay, the other somebody else might have got in and modified the value, but you now you know what the value is. So that it, you won't lose a value while you're doing this. The other person's update got in, now yours comes in behind, but there isn't an ordering of updates. Maybe that update just doesn't last for very long because you come in straight behind it and modify it again but it can be used as the basis for an atomic counter <coughs> without losing an update. But this only works, of course, if it's a single operation on the CPU. If the, the operating system has a chance to interleave between these two, it wouldn't work. So it's the fact that this is a single operation that makes this, makes this possible. And we get this nice little, little diagram like this. So let's see how we're going to do this. We're going to set up something using an atomic counter. Well, there'll be some setup. We'll come back to the setup probably in slides time. But the key point is that the underlying field here that we're going to update, because we're just using this like we did for the regular counter, is in fact going to be volatile. Okay? So how do we set it up? Well, 
We use this class called unsafe. Uh, I've missed off the import line, but the package it lives in is actually some misc. And generally speaking, the experienced programmers probably know that there's kind of a, an alarm bell going off somewhere. Something coming out of the sun packages? Uh, that's not going to be portable, is it? Because it's not part of Java or Javax. It's something internal. I, I noticed they didn't rename it to Oracle MISC either. No, we do. <laughs> so yeah, so we get this object, which is the unsafe object, which gives us access to some of the stuff we want to do. Uh, and we also have this field called value offset, okay, which is a long. Notice that it's static. And what this thing really is, and, and at this point you, this, you probably decide that this is horrendously un-Java-like and evil. That literally is the number of bytes after the start of the memory address of your object where something is located. That's right. We're effectively doing pointer arithmetic. <laughs> okay? So we're going to look up how many bytes are required to get to the get to the field we want. Okay? And here's how we do it. Well there's something in here which is a bit of reflection. Because what we're saying is atomic counter dot class dot get to pen field. We know what that's going to return. So it's a reflective field object. So the field object is passed in to this, this method on unsafe, which somehow using guard magic key from the JVM is going to give us back the number which represents that offset. Okay? We set that up in a static block, it's final, we save it for later. <coughs> okay? And now we have our increment method. And it works like this. We just take the unsafe object and we call it. We say get and add int. Now, just as we, we see for reflective calls where you know, the actual the, the receiver object turns into a parameter, same thing here. So that this object is the argument, that will actually be the receiver. It's obviously contained within the atomic counter class, so it will mean the, this object itself that has been called upon. The value offset, of course, having been initialized once, is effectively a constant. It just is going to tell the, the native code where to look for this. And then we, we update by one. Notice that this says get and add. So it's going to get the original value, add this one on after the value's been got. So we need to correct by one at the end. Okay, down to the Epsilon safe class, if we go looking, we shall find just what I said, that we're just going to loop around. We'll, take, we'll get the, the value here, and notice that this says get in volatile. So the semantics of the volatility of the field are now being carried in the unsafe. Because it knows about that, what I'm going to call an access mode for memory knows that it has to be handled using volatile. Okay, after that we then attempt to do the compare and swap, and that returns true or false. If it returns false, somebody beats us to it. We go around and we try again. Eventually it's going to succeed, we return the value that we get back. Okay. So this is this has no locks, it's lock free. Uh, it's not loop free though, we have to keep trying. And of course, <coughs> nothing in here is a blocking call. Nothing in here is going to put this thread to sleep. And nothing in here involves the operating system. Just to prove I haven't cheated, here we have our two native methods which are, which are present. Both of them have to be implemented in native because they're going to rely upon processor-specific features. To give you the actual um, implementation of this is a little complicated, so I'm going to show you something a bit simpler, um, which is the spin lock implementation. So this shows you how, how we, we actually implement this in assembly language. Um, and something close to this is how the, the reentry block in Java is actually implemented. The key instruction here is actually the exchange, because that is the, an atomic instruction. Uh, it, it also is what's called a locked instruction. So it means that in terms of some of the clever processor trickery that Jim was talking about, that prevents instructions from being reordered across it. Okay. The way to read this is we've got a lock section which sets up some memory which is set to zero. We put one into the accumulator and then we do an exchange with the lock value. And there's two possibilities. Either it was zero, in which case uh, now we've got zero that's been moved into uh, DAX. In which case if we test that against itself, we'll get zero. So we'll pass through this jump instruction and return. That means we locked it. Okay. The other possibility is that somebody else has already locked it. So we come back in, when we exchange EAX with the lock uh, value, we get one back. And then when we test that, oh, we're locked. So jump back to the start of the spin lock and try again. Again, 
no disk, no blocking calls, no operating system. We are going to be burning CPU when we do this. It's going to drive up the CPU utilization because we're just tight looping while we try to come back for the lock. It's another implementation of the similar techniques. Okay, so everything's great, wonderful. Well, maybe not. Because Java 9 changes just one or two little things. <laughs> because up until now, hands up, by the way, who's programming in Java 9 now? Yeah, that's about what I expect. Two people. Um, who has a roadmap where they're going to start implementing Java 9 version yet? One extra person. Good, good, good. Because here's the here's the, the, the horrible part of all of this, is that up till now, you've only had package private visibility le uh, level. You have had no way to say, this package can be accessed by other packages, but only these, and nobody else. Now you have that. That's what modules give you. As well as, you know, the absolutely lovely thing that if you want to call somebody else's public method, and they don't want to export it, guess what? You can't call it anymore. This is a problem. What else is a problem? Reflection. Ah. Oh. So what are we going to do about it? Can't call code in internal packages anymore. Who would like to have a guess as to whether Oracle were keen on the idea of sun.misc being a package that people still had access to? <coughs> yeah, well, absolutely right. They totally weren't. OK, so what are we going to do about this? Well, I'm going to answer that question in a couple of parts. First of all, we need a bit more machinery. We need these things, method handles. Uh, and method handles are kind of interesting. Because they came out in Java 7, they represent this new way of thinking about how to pull stuff and introspect. Basically, you can think about it as a reflection done in a safe and modern way. Um, what they particularly do is they take away the, the old um, set accessible hack, you know, where you get a reflective object and then you call this magic method on it, which says, hey, don't worry about access control anymore. Yeah, well, that's bad for all sorts of reasons. And it, with method handles, we actually don't need to do that. Um, we actually have the ability to, to, to remain compliant with um, access control at runtime, um, but without sidestepping the security manager and, and, and damaging things in the internals. OK, so what do we need to know about them? Um, they come with a new way of talking about type signatures and methods. So now we have these objects with, uh, called method types, which are um, an immutable object which just represents a type signature. So. You don't have to have you know those horrible arrays of class objects that we always used to have to chuck around with reflective reflection. And they are um, they're a lot more efficient. So you don't need to, to create a new type to model each signature. You know, so you have callable, callable returns a value. So you need one type with one generic argument to, to return one value. If you want to model a function signature with like function to A to B, now you have a type which has two generic arguments. Now you want a by function which returns another type now, and you need something with three generic arguments, etc., etc., etc. If you've programmed in Scala and you know how many function traits you end up with, you know that this is this is not a great way to represent type information for um, for very general calls. Instead, with method handles, we do it like this. You have you just have a factory method uh, on method type, which is called simple method type. You pass in the uh, the first argument is the return type of the method you're using to modeling. The other arguments are the arguments. So if it's two string, it's just string dot class. Uh, if it's a setter method, setters return void, so you type void dot class and then the input type. If you want the compare method from string, well it returns in and it takes in two strings. So it's in string string. So far so good. So now we can describe what type of methods we're looking for and what their static signatures should be. We can look them up. And this is how you get around this, the, the, the access control subsystem. You say, based on where I am right now, what can I see? What am I allowed access to at runtime? And based on that, if you can see the method, great. You can get an executable reference to it. If you can't, sorry. And there is no way to subvert this. You, there is literally no equivalent of set accessible. This access control and the way that we do this is absolutely inviolate, which is interesting because it now starts to, to build into the discussion about modules and how we're going to control access to them as well. So this is a great future mechanism. Um, it really is kind of like a second bite of the cherry compared to, compared to reflection. Um, so we have some lookup code, which looks like this. And this, if you put something into to one of your classes, it will give you back a method handle 
for the two-string method on, on that class. Okay, now that's kind of boring because two-string is public and you can you can access it anyway. But if this was not two-string but some private method, you would then have a reference that is executable to your private method, but you can give it to whoever you like. So you can provide selective access control to your internal stuff. You know, it's a little bit wordy, it's a little bit complex to do it on, on a large scale, but you can do it. And completely safety and without upsetting the security manager or violating architectural principles. Great. So now we want to invoke them. You can either do it directly or you have some methods which maybe you can massage the parameters, do boxing and unboxing and all of that stuff. So very, very nice. The code for invoking looks really pretty straightforward. Um, quite a lot like reflection actually. So let's just contrast the two. Here's reflection. You get a method from somewhere, you get an object which is your receiver, and you call m.invoke. Notice how the receiver comes inside the call like that, just as we talked about earlier. And um, for the, the sake of argument, I'm going to pass in a couple of object arguments as well. Good, good. Here's what the bytecode looks like. Uh, I've skipped some bytecodes up the top, so because we're starting at bytecode number 17 here. What we're doing is we're creating a couple of objects and we are loading them into a oh, work. What's this bytecode? AA store. That means we're going to load them into an array. Because if we look at the function signature for the final call, which is for the invoke, we can see where it lives. Java line reflect method, there's the invoke. And what is it? What is the signature? Well, it's being called on object because it's a collection, we don't know what the type is. We're passing in some parameters, an array of object because it's sporadic, but we don't know where any types are. And we're getting back an object because we don't know where any of the types are. Okay, well that's that's useful, I guess. Um, here we have the appropriate similar code for method handle. We're going to look up a uh, method which takes no parameters and returns it. It's the hash code method. We know we're always going to find it, but let's look it up properly. So we find it on the string class, the hash code method, which has the appropriate signature, and then we invoke just in the same way as we did reflectively. Okay, so let's get about that stuff. Um, and actually, the bytecode looks, looks a little different, doesn't it? In particular, instead of the method invoke, we've got a method handle invoke. You see what's different about the type signature here? All of my objects have gone. All of my arrays of objects, of returning objects, it's all gone. This is the actual correct static type signature. Because we take in a string, which is the receiver, and we return in. So the method handles have been able to preserve the static type information into the line code, which means that the, the optimizer and the JIT compiler are going to have a much better time with this. So these method handles really are you know, pretty, pretty great. So let's go back to the problem of unsafe before we see how all of this comes together. Unsafe has an unsupported API. It's very, very popular. Uh, it's not an official standard. It's a dumping ground for non-standard and necessary features. And those features have varying safety. You know, I, I think people may remember you know, Donald Rumsfeld. You have your, your known knowns, your known unknowns, and your unknown unknowns. Well, in unsafe, you've got your safe unsafe. You've got your unsafe unsafe, and you've got, oh my god, don't do that unsafe. <laughs> and they're all mixed together, right? So, so how, how are you going to control this, this API? Well, and when I say features are very safety, what do I really mean? I mean these things. Uh, low, to, low latency stuff, fast deserialization. If you're using any kind of serialization framework, it's going to be using unsafe somehow. Um, if you want to have like off-heat memory, if you want to do the equivalent of an, uh, an array, which has a long index rather than an int index, that's in unsafe. Um, our CAS operations are there. Our CAS operations are the, the sweet, fluffy part of unsafe. It, you can basically, I can't think of any way that you could break your program by, by just doing CAS operations um, based on, on unsafe. Um, but it's not the only thing in there, and there are, there are some very, very dark pieces of magic in there indeed. Um, things like, you know, not uh, creating an object and not running its constructor body. Yeah, just allocating the memory for it. Maybe not even zeroing the memory for it. Yeah, let's play with unsafe C memory semantics. That'll be fun. Um, but of course, we need it because, you know, 
Do you use these libraries? Yeah? All these libraries? Maybe these libraries? Any of those libraries? Uh, at this point, by the way, I got bored and gave up. I, I could have gone on for another 10. I could have gone on basically indefinitely. Basically, everything that you use in any non-trivial Java application, somewhere along the line, uses unsafe. Its transitive dependencies will include unsafe. And it has to go away. Okay? So what are we going to do? We're just going to have this hard, you know, shutter come down. We're not going to, not going to do unsafe anymore. Well, that doesn't sound like a good, good option to me. So what was eventually decided, and if you, if you follow this in the community, there was a public spat between Hazelcast and Oracle about this very issue, um, where Oracle said, "Wait, it's an unsupported API. We told you we could take access to it away at any time. Why didn't you believe us?" Well, because every non-trivial application depends on it. So the compromise is that you get a pass for Java 9 only. You also get a pass for Java 10 because of the changes in release model and the fact that these things are not long-term support releases. Everyone knows that, right? Everyone knows that Java 9 stops being supported the day Java 10 comes out. There's no cut cutover period unless you want to go and try to, and I don't think even Oracle will sell you extended support for it. So, and the day that Java 11 comes out, Java 10 stops dead. It's only the long-term support releases that you get any kind of cover for. So think long and hard before you put 9 into production, because you need to cut over plan to 10 and then to 11 if you do. So yeah, so the new supported APIs that have been created are mostly being created for 11. And we have just have to uh, manage the community and take them along with us, because otherwise we're <coughs> going to end up with a Python 2, Python 3 project problem. Because if it works in Java 8 and doesn't work in Java 9, well, how do you get an option for Java 9 to get the momentum to get people to port their libraries to work on Java 9? You can't. You know, that, that's a real chicken in the egg problem. So what are we going to do about it? Well, these little fellows are going to come to our rescue. We're going to do multi-release jars. Okay. So how does this work? Well, we're going to have a project which, which works correctly in multiple Java versions. Um, they want to depend on library classes that only exist in, in, in version 9. The replacement for the unsafe APIs and access to, the, to those same feature sets but in a controlled way. That means new library classes and they don't exist in earlier versions. But we still want to be able to use that jar and have it link properly. Okay. So what we do is we include a manifest entry in, in manifest or MF um, which means nothing to Java 8 and that entry is multi-release. If you are multi-release and you're on a version of Java, 9 or above, that supports it, you can use variant code. There's a special directory, meta int versions, and then the version you're talking about, where you can put code which will not be scanned by, by pre-9 versions of Java, and it will override the versions of classes that are in the room. So the class loader will preferentially load from that directory a version of the class. So you have to have the classes named the same, so package structure, but now you can load one in nine and have a fallback version in eight, effectively. Um, if you want to do this on mainland, the best way to do it is to build it using Java 8 uh, for most of it, or the Java 9 portion separately, um, and keep the build configuration as simple as you can. So for mainland, two separate pro uh, projects, one for the main dependency and one for the second one, Use the Maven dependency project if you're a Maven shop. If you're a Gradle shop, you do it using a source set, um, and you compile the different the, the version I code using a different compiler. Okay, so let's pull everything together. Talk about var handles. So the var handles are um, an extension of the method handles concept. I'll explain why it's required uh, in a sec. Um, what they do is they add new concurrency modes and new barriers which are now available in Java 9. This basically allows us to update the JMM uh, and also to keep pace with C++. Because you know that, that saying that you know, great artists steal? Well, great programming languages steal from each other. You know, Java had this great mem memory model. Eventually C++ decided, hey, let's get one of those too. So they took the JMM as a starting point, added some more stuff on top of it. Well, maybe they were a little bit ahead, but now with Java 9, you know, take the time to take the lead back. So that's all, all coming in with, with var handles as well. Because the thing is, that the method handles API always provided you 
with a way of accessing fields as well. It was not supposed to just be methods, it was supposed to be everything. So you can, there are things like find getter and find setter, and they will, which are present on the method handle, and on lookup, and you will get back a method handle which corresponds to access to those fields. Yeah. Even if there isn't an actual getter or setter, it will protect them. It will give you an executable piece of code that corresponds to a, a vanilla getter or setter, which is great. There's just one problem. It only deals with the mainstream case. It only deals with a completely vanilla field, which isn't volatile and doesn't have any other additional semantics on it. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to make up a new API. The our handles are a slight tweak. So it goes into Java Lang Invoke, alongside where the, the method handles already are. And they support dozens of new access modes. Yes, you get volatile. You get a whole raft of other things as well. You also get access to memory fences directly. So you can work with the hardware supported fences. So, so things like a load load fence means that if you have one load before the instruction and one after, you won't be reordered across the fence which some processors will do. And here, by the way, is another slightly dirty little secret that, we, that you may not know. When you write concurrent code, it is not the JMM that protects you. It is your hardware. The Intel hardware has far, far stronger provisions about what can and can't be done in terms of reordering and mucking about with your code when it's actually executed than the, the JMM does. The JMM makes really minimum guarantees. Um, we can now access these directly through the VAR handle. The VAR handle enables us to program essentially down to the level of what's on the hardware. Okay? Not only that, but the mechanism now provides this great way to, to extend the gem and semantics in a way that's future-proofed. Because we can just add more hardware modes as, as we need to with successive versions of Java. So this is actually a really good replacement API for the part of unsafe we needed. Hey, we just wanted our CAS instructions. We just wanted volatile access. But instead, we've got this, this lovely API which comes us to do a lot of really low level stuff. And I've got five minutes left because I actually came with a demo. This will go wrong, because they always do. But I've got the atomic counter class that I showed you. And let's do this with version 9. Let's see. Switch the mirror. OK, can you see that at the back? The font's a bit small. Um, it's been a long time since I've actually used Emacs in the demo, but it's, um, it's actually a, a bit easier to, to, to use because I'm trying to chop and change between two environments. Let's a bit. So, can, can you see it at the back? Okay. Yep. yep. All right, so I've got one version 9. Uh, shell here, and I've got one version 8, and let's have a look where we are. So, Inside of Emacs, we've got a simple main thing, and it's going to call atomic counter. We're just going to increment atomic counter for the one. Well, let's. Here's the version 8 code. Um, it's a bit longer than it otherwise was. It uses unsafe. There was one thing on the slides I didn't get heckled. I thought I might do. Um, of course, you can't really access the unsafe object directly. Right? You're not allowed to. If you're in a Java package, like your Java utility concurrent, fine. But actually, the security manager will, will reject it if you try. You actually have to use reflection to get it. So we do that here. We just use the get declared field trip, look at the field object, set it to be true, and then get the object back. So far, so good. Apart from that, it's all exactly the same, and the increment is, is that as I promised it. Okay. So that's and here it is in bar handles. Notice that the ugly field offset and my dead pointer arithmetic has gone. And instead, I've now just got a bar handle on the object I absolutely want. We use the method handles API to look it up. Saw the value, we've got the find bar handle, and now we just do the get and add, which is used for um, the semantics of, of uh, providing uh, atomic access, which of course will only work on an actual int or long 
or some other numeric field. So I compile those two separately. And if I show you. There's the standard one. There's the version 8 one, and I've got these compiled. And this special jar command here, if I run on version 9, I'm going to create this var h jar with a main class because it's executable, uh, with, with classes, and with this minus 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 9, I'm going to include the override for version 9. And now, if I do Java minus 9, That's the one handles version. Which as you can see, it's actually got the system output in there. Okay, just to show you that I haven't cheated. There you go, it's timestamp for 2037, so I really need to finish up. But now if I run from here, remember this one is Java version 8. the unsafe code. Okay, so now that was a bit, you know, of extra craft and a bit clunky, but it, it works. We now have the, the opportunity not only to take advantage of the, the APIs which are present in 9 and coming in 10 and 11, but also to still maintain backwards compatibility. So there's a lot of work to be done, and a lot of your favorite libraries are still haven't even started this process yet, but it is coming and it is possible to do it with your own code. So, thank you very much. Any questions? Yes. You see a problem with, uh, let's say, uh, you know, because of all these issues with uh, multi-cores, that uh, job developers become more defensive their programming and maybe um, not take advantage of some of the features of multi-core and then that gives Java programming itself a, a, a bad name because, um, I don't know. So, so do you think, uh, is multi-core going to make Java programmers more defensive? Um, maybe, but another answer might be that, that maybe the, the, the biggest burden here is on the library part of We need better concurrency abstractions. Thread is a horrible concurrency abstraction, right? It's like the assembly language of concurrent programming. We want to be building things which are much more fire and forget, where the runtime of the libraries is doing all the heavy lifting for us. Yeah. And in some other languages, there, there, was, there were some good ideas. And the nice thing about, about Java is that, that it is a slow moving and conservatively designed language, um, which is as it should be. It means that the, the abstraction should be well engineered. I mean, to, to give you one example, there are things like fibers and continuations on the horizon. They're not here yet, but actually being able to program with, with first class fibers may get people out of the habit of, of, of dealing with threads all the time. So, I hope so anyway. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Quite a few times I've seen people like get scared because they like, looked at some concurrent code from, I don't know, early days, all using threads, completely like wrong. Um, so I, I think, yeah, what Ben says in Java utils are concurrent abstractions to think of things more like tasks rather than as threads uh, in terms of units of work. But then also some of the libraries that are there in util concurrent, like concurrent hash map. And then beyond that, if you need anything else, like some like expert buffer, for instance, there's open source projects like Agrona that have some really sophisticated concurrency utilities in them. So there's a lot more out there now to make actually reasoning about concurrent program easier. Cool. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, with the memory model, uh, I, I mean, with the Java nine coming in, uh, I was thinking in terms of the, the, so there are only two hands that have actually went up when you ask how many are yeah. <laughs> taking up Java nine. This might be the reason. So how much work there is before people start? People get excited about the other um, things about Java nine. Oh, you can do this. You can do that. However, most haven't thought about internal details, how applications don't start, suddenly stop working or work in the wrong way. Um, so 
well, how much work would be actually to know? Also, certainly, we cannot be certain that the software would def always work, right? But we can be sure, like, like um, Beth said, uh, James said, um, that it doesn't work. Okay, it doesn't work, but you're never sure that how it will work. It might work now, but a month now it might work on Java. It might not work on Java, but Java 9. So how can we be sure that the first cut or something coming up from the company that would help us to search, be sure, good for a Java 9? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, so I, I think, first of all, the projects which are gonna, gonna go first to Java 9, I expect, will be Greenfield, okay? Because if you are designing an application and architecting for modules right from the start, you are gonna get a better application. Modules are an architecturally very sensible te technology, um, and they will build better applications for you. But that's not the, the question. The, the, the question is, what about all the stuff you already have? Yeah, I don't know about you, but it's not always very easy to go and get a large amount of budget to re-architect a working application for some nebulous tech debt reason. Yeah, <laughs> who wants to have that conversation with their boss? Hands up. Yeah, I'm like nobody. There we are. So, so yeah. So, so it's going to be tough, right? So the greenfield applications will go first. Things with a specific technical need. For, 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 for narrow technical things that are in Java 9 will also go at this point because the benefit outweighs the cost. You know, so things like um, compact strings, right? So everyone knows that a, a Java string is backed by uh, a char array, okay? Now if all of your strings are ASCII or Latin 1, you waste twice the memory you need on strings. If you are a Solar or an Elasticsearch or some other, like a search engine which has got a lot of string data in it, and I've seen ones which have got 40 and 60 gig <coughs> virtual strings. Well, you might look at that and think, okay, if I move to Java 9, I cut my string utilization in half, my heap size is now cut in half. Hey, guess what? That has a great operational knock on in terms of how long my GC pauses are. Right? So, those types of applications which have that narrow technical reason. <coughs> Some people um, can't cope with, with, um, with the current version of the G1 collector. They want the new version that's in 9. Because, oh yeah, that's the other thing. The Java, the 8 and 9 versions of G1 are completely different. So if you need that new version, well, you just have to go to 9 to get it, because you can't get it any other way. Um, but apart from, from that, the other applications, well, the first thing I think most people will do is start off um, by just basically running a Java 9 runtime. So you're still compiling on Java 8, um, and you're still producing jars, and you still have a class path, so you haven't modularized. Um, you're just you're just running everything as it was. It's just like the old world on a new runtime. And then bit by bit, you can start to think, okay, let's swap over. Let's move from class path to module path. Okay, now there's a bit of work to do because you can't have um, both a class path and a module path. If you if you if you swap over, all of your jars become turned into what are called automatic modules. And there is some work with that because not every dependency works properly. You have to actually manually fix some of those those namings. So incrementally, bit by bit, you can start to get there. But it, it won't happen overnight. And are there going to be you know, a little bit of a Python 2, Python 3 problem? I think so. Do I believe that there'll be Java 8 containers and runtimes still operating in 10 years? Absolutely. 15 years? Quite likely. 20? Wouldn't bet against it. Yeah. From just from, 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 from applications where there is not the, the appetite or the will or the budget to actually move them. Thank you very much again.